This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So let me go on then and talk just very briefly about um, the lecture tonight. And um, we've seen a lot of polls lately. How many people got tired of reading about polls and which were accurate and which weren't accurate and Nate Silver and all of that? But this was one. There was a Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index that came out, and it showed that women at midlife between the ages of 45 and 55 actually have the lowest well-being of any group or gender in the United States. And when they studied that and looked closer at what it was that was pulling down that well-being, and this is what I'm trying to focus on in this class, I want to see the well-being of women go up across the board, but particularly for this age group, part of the um, discussion about this was that there was a storm of obligations that people have had. And you know, I've shown some slides about those. Um, but rather than repeat those slides, I thought I would just share with you a story that came out at that time about Debbie Watkins. Um, and this was on ABC News. And here's a picture of Debbie. She's a real person. Debbie wakes up with the sun. Her kids still at live at home. She works a full-time job and spends her lunch breaks visiting her mother, who recently suffered a stroke. Watkins is married and attempting to stay healthy. It's, oh, wow, I've not, I've not spent enough time with mom. I'm not giving her enough support, she told ABC News. But then I go over and I spend more time with her, and then I'm thinking, wow, my kids are needing more of my time. My husband needs more of my time or my job. It's a constant feeling that you've never done enough for any particular group that needs your time. Most definitely, I think that comes with the female territory. And someday we should do a course on this, because I think it also comes with the male territory. Um, she said, I want to find a corner and curl myself up and get away from everybody and everything, but that doesn't happen. So this is what a lot of people say is the way they feel. And that was, they went into the story on ABC News about this poll, saying that they think that's what's pulling the well-being down. And it's actually more striking now than it was, say, the generation before, though we don't have the exact same polling data. Um, Holly Thacker, who's an expert at the Cleveland Clinic, talked about women put first all the demands of work, home, and caregiving everything they're doing for everyone else. And as a result, she highlighted, and this is a woman at the Cleveland Clinic that has this big program on women's health, as a result, women crimp on sleep. And I'm just going to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have stayed up late to try to get everything done? I see a lot of hands. Like sometimes before you travel, for example, I, I find myself, it's four in the morning, and I'm still making little bags, you know, little things of shampoo and making sure I've got all the medicines that everybody needs and putting everything, you know, getting everything finished up so that I, by the time I get on the plane, I just crash. And then I just hope I don't snore on the plane. Oh, it would be everyone, you know, one of those things. Okay, so, um, which I mentioned because if anybody does that here, and thanking my assistant who's handing out these slides to people as they come in. Thank you so much. So let me now, without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. We're going to hear about women and sleep from rest, stressful to restful. She will tell us how we can get better night's sleep. And then next week, we'll do Mind Your Heart, Stress, Mental Health, and Heart Disease, and how all of those intersect, um, both for men and for women. So let me tell you a little about our wonderful speaker. We really have 
national expert here. Uh, Dr. Catherine Lee is a professor of nursing in the Department of Family Health Care Nursing at UCSF. She holds the James and Marjorie Livingston Endowed Chair in Nursing, and she's the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Nursing here at UCSF, actually in this building. She completed her PhD training at the University of Washington in 1986 and was a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Nurse Scholar from 86 to 1988. She's board certified in behavioral sleep medicine and an elected fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. She's the past member of the Sleep Advisory Board to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at NIH. And it is in the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that also handles all the grants for sleep disorders. She's authored over 150 publications, but we aren't to compare ourselves with other women. Don't feel bad. We don't go there. We just feel happy for her. Um, and these are all related to sleep and women's health. And she's currently an associate editor for the journal Behavioral Sleep Medicine. And she's on the editorial bo board of Sleep Medicine Reviews. So I give you Catherine Lee. I think you have to get out of this t-shirt. Oh, I think he's going to do it for you. It mag magically happens. Isaac. Um, He's going to come down and help you. There it is. Okay. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to do this um, this evening. And I'll thank you in advance for staying awake during a talk on sleep in the evening. And I hope that you weren't staying up uh, late last night and you, you'll have some, um, some good questions for me. Uh, I'm going to talk about sleep. And I thought these images were kind of interesting to get from the stressful types of sleep in the um, what I think of as the childbearing years where sleep tends to be a lot more stressful and then hopefully we'll be like the woman on the other side when it's restful. Um, I'm not sure when that is, whether it's certainly not before menopause, it's not during menopause. I'm not <laughs> sure why she's uh, sleeping so well, but at <laughs> any rate. Um, what I want to do tonight is cover three main things with you. The, the healthy sleep patterns across the lifespan, so we get a little discussion going of uh, how sleep changes as we get older, and the biopsychosocial health um, effects of sleep loss. In nursing, we like to talk about the biological health, the social health, the physical, mental well-being of the whole person and not focus just on um, some of the, the sleep disorders and diagnostic categories. And then finally, talk about sleep hygiene, which may be a new term for you, so we'll explain that a little bit, and then uh, look at some of the healthy sleep I interventions that might be used to improve your sleep. So we know a lot about sleep from sleep laboratory studies. Um, this is a typical sleep laboratory where you're asking someone to volunteer for a sleep study, and they may get paid or they may not. But if you think about the kinds of studies that get reported about sleep, they're often on subjects like this who can sleep in a strange sleep laboratory with all the electrodes on their head. So either they're really good sleepers and they don't really get bothered or concerned about signing up for a sleep study, or they're so bad at sleeping that they need help desperately and they volunteer for a study. So with that caveat, a lot of the research is really on um, a very skewed population, and how many of you would go into a sleep lab and, and volunteer for a study? Um, and what would be your motivation, I think, as you think about these data, look, think about that question as well. Now, the typical adult sleep um, actually looks very similar to this in, in young adults. When you're awake and you turn out the light to go to sleep, it takes about five minutes to fall asleep. And then you go down into stage one, light sleep, and stage two, light sleep, before you get into stage three and stage four, deep sleep. And then you come back up gradually to the first REM period, which is about 90 minutes after you fall asleep. Now, if you uh, take five minutes to fall asleep, that's great. <laughs> If you fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow, anybody like that? Uh, it really does mean you're sleep deprived. It's not necessarily good that you fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow because it means that you could also then become so sleep deprived that you're falling asleep as you're stopped at a stop sign or in traffic or driving home from something um, and you fall asleep at the wheel. So we're, we're really busy with a campaign about driving while drowsy, 
um, and looking at this issue of how long it takes to fall asleep. I'll talk more about initiation insomnia later, but that's really taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep when you've turned out the lights. So as you fall asleep and go into deep sleep, you'll notice that the first REM period is about 90 minutes. As we get older, these REM periods get closer together across the night, and we lose this deep sleep stage. Um, as the night goes on, we all would do this, even in our, in our youth. But as we get older, we have very little deep sleep stages, and most of our sleep is stage one and two, a little bit of awake time, one and two, and, and one and two, and so on. So it explains a little bit about why older people wake up more, they're not getting the deep sleep stages where you're really not hearing uh, a lot of noises. Um, it protects your, your, um, your sleep. And as we get older without this deep sleep, little noises are more likely to wake us up in light sleep and in REM sleep. And so we wake up and then we start all over again with stage one and two and never get into deep sleep. The end of the night, at after seven hours, if you spend more time in bed and you're in and out of stage two or light sleep and wake and light sleep and wake, it's very exhausting. So the idea of good sleep hygiene is to get up when you wake up, get up and start the day and do something, uh, make more use of the day. If you lie in bed going in and out of light sleep, you get more and more tired rather than more and more rested. What I've learned in my research over time is that there's really no place like home. Now, I originally started with my dissertation. I studied women across the menstrual cycles and brought them into a sleep lab this sleep laboratory, actually, nice wallpaper. They could bring their own pillows. Everything was, was nice. But they, um, after, oh, about the first 20 subjects I studied, there were a couple of them that got pregnant, and they loved coming to the sleep lab. I found out. I thought I was studying women and ignoring the first night with all this equipment on because that's an adaptation to the laboratory. And what I found out was they loved coming to the lab because it was a recovery from the sleep deprivation they had at home. <laughs> they could come into the lab when they wanted to. They could go to bed when they wanted, turn the light. I was out in the other room with a little bell that they could ring and come, I could come and um, help them and they could get up when they wanted, and they, di they didn't have to contend with the snoring spouse, the barking dog, the noise in the streets, and um, they loved coming to the lab. So I was really studying the recovery from chronic sleep deprivation at home. So we then, then we're able to move to the home to do a lot of sleep studies with ambulatory monitoring, and we set things up and, and work it through in the home, and they could we could put all the electrodes on, and then in the morning they could take it all off and, um, and leave, um, leave it behind. We'd come and pick it up later. I've done this now for many, many years, and we've even done it with pregnant women and postpartum women. The, the little babies at one, two, and three months old don't pull the wires off. And uh, it, 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 I really did get great data from these kinds of studies in the natural environment where everything else is going on with them. Um, we did a poll, um, talking about last week's polls that you're all curious about, but this, this was the Sleep in America poll from the National Sleep Foundation. In 2007, I was involved in a few of the previous ones, but this is the most recent one that's looked at sleep in women. From all of these polls in the past, women report sleeping about six and a half hours at night, and women report about um, 10 to 15 minutes more sleep than men, but it's women who complain about their sleep. They have more complaints of insomnia than, than men do. And women have more complaints about daytime sleepiness than men. So we've compared men and women, adults, across all of these surveys and find women have more sleep complaints and more problems. So we did this uh, telephone survey of over 1,000 women who were 18 to 64 in the US. It was about 25 minutes on the phone with them, and it was very representative of households with a phone. It was collected in 2006, and um, we oversampled for pregnant and postpartum women, which I'm not going to really talk about tonight, but we had a margin of error of about 3%, is that like the elections, I guess, too. So before I talk a little bit about those results, I want you to look at this and 
and think about what it means to you. Just think about it as I give you the, the next uh, set of data from that talk, okay? So in this poll, we found out that working mothers were the highest um, complainers about their insomnia. They also used the most caffeine, which was to help them cope with the, the sleepiness they had during the day. And they had the highest rate of drowsy driving. 35% of them actually said that they drove while they were very sleepy and, and almost falling asleep at the wheel with a child in the car. It was very troubling. Uh, it was the group of 50-somethings, 50, 50 to 64 was the, the name that they gave them. Um, there were backpackers and briefcase women, and there were 50-something women. And the 50-somethings were the ones who had the highest rate of sleep aid use, sleeping pills. So this is how I think of um, the baby on board after that kind of data, is that I used to think you know, oh, there's a baby in that car, I'm going to stay back, I don't want to rear in that car um, with the baby on board. And in fact, with all these data about sleepy moms driving, I think it, there's a dangerous sleep-deprived mother behind the wheel who's going to hit me um, and cause more accidents. So to be driving defensively because of this issue, not so much, I mean, there there is an issue with the baby on board, but. Um, it sort of sheds new meaning, interpretation on how to avoid them in, in traffic. So when we look at the, bi the gender differences in how women report their sleep problems, is it because they're just perceiving more sleep problems? We see this in a lot of other kinds of studies of symptoms. Women report more symptoms, uh, depression, anxiety, and, and so on than, than men do. Is it, um, as Dr. Chesney was talking about, is it the family care and the role responsibilities that are, are uh, causing you to sleep um, poorly? Is it somebody else's sleep disorder? Are you s actually sleeping with a bed partner who has sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing? Or are you caring for children who have parasomnias? Parasomnias are the kinds of sleep problems that occur between sleep stages, between um, light sleep and deep sleep and uh, consist of things like teeth grinding, walk, uh, sleepwalking, talking, um, bedwetting. Those are all parasomnia sorts of problems. So is it the, um, the child that uh, is having these sleep problems that's keeping the, the mom awake more? Or is it really the, you know, waiting for that phase-delayed teenager who's out with the car at night? Because in the, some of these studies when they said, can you come back and study me after my children are grown up when I'm sleeping better finally? Um, and other women will say, you know, you're never going to sleep um, good again because you're worried about the, the teenager out with the car. And there's good reason to worry about that as well. So there could be lots of reasons why. Uh, I tend to look more at the hormonal influences on sleep in women. And uh, some of these um, issues are actually not really well studied yet. So when we looked at the uh, sleep poll, <laughs> this is a, a slide I found on the internet. So it's, it's uh, not anybody who's been in my sleep studies. But in this poll, women said that, that uh, about 20% of women said they were awakened by a child during the night and it interrupted um, their sleep. And 9% actually said that they sleep with children. And yet 17% were awakened by a pet, and 14% sleep with a pet. More, more women sleep with a pet than sleep with their child. Um, I've always thought this is you know, pretty common, a, a small cat, a small dog, but there are lots of pets that people <laughs> sleep with. And you never know what someone's, who what someone's sleeping with. But in a sleep disorder center, when you're asking about their sleep problems and how the environment is at home, and you, you, we really don't ask a lot about pets until this poll uh, data came out. Um, why women sleep with pets when they could disturb their sleep so much is an interesting story. I know with some women who have a pet dog, uh, the dog might be barking a lot during the night or want to go out. And some women who sleep alone um, without a, a bed partner and have a dog actually feel safer and sleep better. And they know that if they wake up during the night and it, there's not a dog that's disturbed or barking, that, that they're OK and they can go back to sleep. But if the dog's barking, then they, they're more alerted and they get up and, and do something about it. 
So in nursing, we actually uh, have conceptual models for how we look at sleep loss. We look at insufficient sleep. That's due to age or your growth and development or lifestyle. I talked to a group of teenager, teenage girls at a local high school, and I said, it's like burning the candle at both ends. And they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> No, none uh, whatsoever. And, and so if, if you are really taking care of everything in the family before you could go to bed uh, and you're getting up extra early to get something done for you, a lot of women I know like to write and the only chance they get to do that is uh, at four in the morning so they'll get up early and, and write or do some of the work for themselves. Um, we, we've got a slogan based on some of these findings that you really should make a sl sleep a priority for yourself. It's uh, in pregnancy, it's sleeping for two. Uh, and in other women, make sleep a priority in, in your life will help deal with some of these lifestyles. You're not very effective um, in social relationships if you're really sleep deprived. So insufficient sleep is one major cause of sleep problems and sleep loss in healthy people. In um, healthcare, we think about fragmented sleep more often, and that's related to sleep disorders like sleep disordered breathing and sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless legs, um, a lot of uh, very serious sleep disorders, or acute and chronic illnesses that keep people awake. If you have renal problems or pulmonary problems or gastrointestinal problems, it's difficult to get a good night's sleep without it being fragmented. Whatever the reason is, sleep loss happens, and it has adverse health outcomes. And so some of the biopsychosocial outcomes include physiological problems. So we know now that immune function and fat and glucose metabolism are affected by sleep loss. And I'll talk more about immune function uh, in a second. And we know that cognitively and behaviorally, when we're at a loss of sleep, we have fatigue, impaired memory, cognition problems, and accidents and errors. We also have social issues with poor family interactions and work environment problems. If someone has difficulty getting up in the morning, they have a harder time getting to work at 8 o'clock, and they sleep in, they lose their jobs, they can't um, drive if they're sleepy, they take public transportation and they fall asleep and miss their bus stops, and there are a lot of issues with um, the family dynamics and with work environment issues. With the immune function, there's some interesting data, and it's not new, and I just want to make sure everybody knows this. How many of you have had your flu shot already this year? Great. Did you get a good night's sleep before that flu shot or after that flu shot? There's a lot of data now that would indicate that if you're not getting sleep, and in studies of, of um, healthy young men, they have deprived them of sleep to four hours a night for four nights, then given them the flu shot. Uh, the other group sleeps normally, and 10 days later, they have a much lower titer to their flu shot um, response rate than the, the young healthy men who got the normal sleep time. This was in 2002. It's been replicated in a fair number of other types of studies, including hep hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, let me show you the results. These are a little easier to interpret than some of the other vaccinations and immunization issues, but if both groups are um, sleeping fine, they get their flu shot. The group that actually had uh, good night's sleep after the vaccine had a much higher titer uh, for hep A vaccine than the group that was left awake and kept awake that whole night before their flu shot. So uh, it's a very critical issue with cytokine metabolism going on in, um, in sleep, and sleep is very important for immune function. Now, I've actually looked at sleep in pregnancy, and this was an issue, talk about publication um, problems, because I was publishing on sleep in pregnancy, and I sent this to a couple of OB journals, and they said, I'm sorry, we don't have anybody who can review any papers on sleep uh, for women. <laughs> Could you suggest some reviewers? And uh, it was very difficult to, to get this published. But we looked at women during their third trimester, about three weeks before delivery, and then we were actually doing a sleep intervention study later. But in this study, uh, just vicariously, what we found was that the, the women who had um, seven hours of sleep or more had labor of 17 hours. 
their C-section rate was about 11%, and at the, at the time the study was done, it was close to 30% in the general population. The women who had six to seven hours of sleep had three hours longer labor, a 34% um, C-section rate, so they were three and a half times more likely to have a C-section. And then the group, uh, believe it or not, there are women in the third trimester who are sleeping less than six hours, and those women had uh, 29 hours of labor, t 10 hours longer than the other group, and 37% uh, C-section rate. And this was four and a half times more C-section um, experiences than the women who slept seven hours or, or longer. We've replicated this in, in other uh, data, and this was with objective sleep measures as well as their own subjective sleep reports. And of course, with C-sections, you always worry about the size of the baby, so we controlled for the baby's birth weight. And um, I think now if we tell women, get a good night's sleep, make sleep a priority for you, you'll have 10 hours shorter labor and, <laughs> and less likely to have a C-section. Um, I think that's pretty compelling data. So when we looked at the um, uh, model again, we can talk about immune function, uh, fat and glucose metabolism. Again, with this, with fat and glucose, if you are sh sleeping uh, short hours, you're more likely to look like a type 2 diabetic. Your fat and glucose, leptin and ghrelin levels are um, much more like a type 2 diabetic, insulin-resistant sort of person. You can take type 2 diabetics, bring them into a sleep lab, and extend their sleep time and actually correct some of their um, glucose and, and, uh, and fat metabolism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cognitive and behavioral fatigue. Nothing new to you. You know what you feel like when you haven't slept, um, the cognitive problems and the accidents and errors that you're prone to. Sleep loss in our society affects about 70 million Americans. It's adding a lot to the billion dollars of, of health care costs each year. The Institute of Medicine estimated that drowsy driving was responsible for 20 percent of all the motor vehicle accidents um, in the U.S., and that drowsy driving caused about a million crashes and 8,000 deaths each year. Um, a, about 60 percent of those Accidents are in adolescents who are driving drowsy and not sleeping well. Adolescents need about nine hours of sleep, and they're also getting six or seven hours. So this was uh, quite compelling data to really cause a lot of the sleep organizations to put out drowsy driving campaigns. Um, when you're sleep deprived and not getting enough sleep, they'll say that your performance is um, lowered by about 33% during the day, and that never meant much to me. I don't know if it means any, what, what's a 33% decrease in daytime performance? I'm not sure. But the data that has been coming out lately is more, much more compelling, that if you have 24 hours of continuous wake time, and it's equivalent to a blood alcohol level of 0.1%, you, we know that the intoxication legal limit in the U.S. is 0.08. So one night of sleep deprivation uh, is comparable to a decrement in performance that looks like intoxication. I think that's a, a lot more compelling than a 33% decrease in performance, whatever that is. So I want to talk a little bit about midlife women. As I get older, I'm starting to study more and more older women and issues around menopause are... Um, are quite unique uh, to women's health in particular. So I define middle age as 40 to 60, and, and I noticed on the earlier slide the midlife time period was 45 to 55. I thought it was supposed to get older. Um, I like kind of 50 to 70 now is, is midlife, <laughs> or 80, yeah, is midlife probably. Uh, but at, the, at this point we were doing a study of um, of 40 to 50 year old women before menopause and looking at sleep. So some are starting families, others are grandmothers. There's no generic, you know, midlife woman. Uh, some children have left home and other adult children are coming back. So some women are boomerang mothers. Um, they're caring for spouses or elderly family members. And then sometimes you're caring for both. It's children and elderly. So that's sandwiches. So a midlife woman could be a boomerang or a sandwich. Take your pick. Um, but there are lots of reasons for sleep problems. And 
why sleep isn't a priority for, for women in midlife. Menopause um, or estrogen insufficiency is the most common uh, symptom or problem associated with hot flushes and, and night sweats. Uh, it's blamed on estrogen, and I, I'm going to show you some data that will say that the sleep problems occur even before the onset of uh, menopause. So when we looked at hot flashes and sleep way back in the, oh gosh, now, 88, when I was in Seattle, we looked at women who were perimenopausal, who had symptoms and didn't have symptoms in the sleep lab, and there was really very little difference in their objective polysomnographic sleep. The difference between a wake time of 10% and 13% is almost nothing. Um, and we've had other people who've replicated that a few years later, didn't believe us, and then looked at other women, flashers and non-flashers, and there's just only about 5% difference between their wake time during the night. So not enough to explain all of the complaints about their insomnia uh, during menopause. Hormone replacement therapy actually helped reduce the symptom experience and complaints, but it had no effect on sleep changes in the stages or the architecture of sleep. Women, we did learn from these RCT, um, H, hormone replacement therapy studies, was that there's very low incidence of periodic limb movements during sleep for women in this age group and a low incidence of sleep disordered breathing. We see quite a higher incidence of this in men and it's thought that um, progesterone was protective of breathing issues for women and that once menopause hit, women would have similar rates of, of sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It's much more associated with obesity uh, than with hormones. Friedman and Roars in um, Detroit actually didn't believe anybody either, and they did their own study of symptomatic midlife women, and they were, they were really scratching their heads after this study. But they did point out that with very good methodology, women were having about five hot flashes during the night, and it ranged from one to 18. So there are some women who are severely affected by their hot flash. But women who didn't complain at all about hot flashes had hot flashes during the night and didn't know it, didn't wake up. And there were no differences in their sleep patterns either, no differences in uh, any of their self-report, no differences in their amount of wake time. So again, all these objective measures are showing the same thing. So what we did was look at sleep over time from premenopause to postmenopause, and we looked at all of these factors, all the biological, psychological, social issues in their lives. Um, every six months. And we looked at FSH level, and FSH follicle stimulating hormone gets very high when you're menopausal because you don't have the estrogen to, to counter it, and so the, the FSH levels rise. It's a good indication of menopausal status. We looked at diet, exercise, a lot of diet recalls. Um, I would have liked to have hear, heard your la lecture from last week about diet. Uh, we asked these women lots of um, questions about their diet and did body weight, um, bioelectrical impedance, and so on. And we looked at stress and family and social relationships as they changed over time. We had quite a group of investigators on this team. Some of you might have actually been in the study um, when we, when we, this in the San Francisco Bay Area. They had to be a community-based sample of healthy women. A lot of previous studies got women from sleep disorder centers or menopause clinics where women are going because they have problems. We recruited from the community, and they had to live here at least 20 years, speak English, and be between 40 and 48 with regular cycles. So what we found when we asked them on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the PISQI um, self-report questionnaire, has about 21 items. It's about two pages, and it asks women about their sleep and disruptions and sleep quality and quantity. And a score above five is indicative of, of a sleep, severely disturbed sleep. All our women were above five, and these were healthy women in the community. But women without children and with children, it didn't matter. Their scores weren't really very, weren't different significantly. Employed and unemployed women didn't differ on their self-report. There was no relation with, with uh, having to get up to urinate at night or hot flashes or exercise, alcohol, and caffeine, which you would think would be a problem. And there was no relationship with uh, low-fat diet. 
Um, when we looked, though, at single women versus married women, it was the partnered women who had uh, better sleep by self-report than the single women. Now, that just shot my theory all, all apart because I was thinking it was women who had the, uh, the noisy bed partner, um, but it was really the single women who were, had much more uh, problems with their sleep. And as we found in lots of other studies, it's smokers, in the Bay Area, there are 22% who smoke, and their uh, self-reported sleep was much worse than non-smokers. It was also worse for African Americans in our sample. Let me show you some of these data. This is the um, blue bar is African American, the orange bar is European American Caucasian, and the green bar is Latinas. Uh, with self-report, the African American women were above five, on the scale, and the other two groups of women were close to five. When we asked them how much sleep they got during the weekdays, it was about seven hours, uh, less than the Caucasian and the Latinas. And on weekends, as most people do, get another 30 minutes or so of sleep and, and sleep um, over seven, almost eight hours of, of sleep on weekends. That's fine, but you can't really make up chronic sleep debt from a, a night or two on the weekend of, of sleeping in. It's really the sleep during the week that's important. And we'll go through a little bit about why and how much sleep you need um, in a few minutes. We actually looked at objective sleep data as well as that self, the Pittsburgh self, Pittsburgh self, no, Pittsburgh sleep quality index score, PISQUI score. Um, I don't usually lecture in, in the evening. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> um, we, we also used an objective measure, but instead of bringing them in the lab and or studying their sleep at home, we used a wrist monitor that will actually calculate wake and sleep, and it's an accelerometer that gets the speed of movements as well as how much movement there is and looks at the minute before, the minute after, and quantifies their sleep, uh, much better than you can do on your own. So this is an example of the output. Uh, at 6 o'clock, or 1,800 hours, she put it on. She took a little nap around uh, dinner, the news, uh, whatever, uh, watching TV maybe. Woke up and then went to bed. And then there are times when you move during the night, and this bar here is scored as sleep. There's a few little awakenings, but not much. And then during the day, lots of physical activity. This night, she reported two hot flashes during the night. So there's normal waking daytime activity. But the two hot flashes occurred at 2400, or just after midnight, and then at 2 in the morning. And again, about 4 when she woke up and just and got up. So what she said she experienced during the night is what happened. But it really, this is not as bad as some uh, studies where the women are just drenched in sweat, and they get up, and they have to change the sheets and, and dry off. Um, she wasn't experiencing that kind of um, sleep fragmentation. But we have had studies, for example, with men with prostate cancer who are taking hormonal therapy who wake up with very severe hot flashes five or six times a, a night. So their hot flashes look much worse than the women we studied. Again, these were women who weren't in sleep clinics or in sleep disorder center, just community-based. So that's the kind of data you get with an objective measure. And again, the African-American women are getting less sleep. So it's not just subjective self-report, but they're getting six and a half, um, six to six and a half hours of, of sleep, whereas the uh, Caucasians on three different times every six months we looked at them are getting close to seven hours. And the Latinas are in between with of almost seven hours of sleep. So it's not just their subjective report um, for this, for this uh, ethnic difference. What we did find in the overall sample, we had over about 350 women. We did some analysis of all the factors together, and the, the, there were about 36 percent of women who scored more than five on the PISQUI um, self-report for sleep complaints. But it wasn't really very much related to their biological factors. It wasn't age or their hormone levels, body weight or diet, smoking, but it was physical activity. 
So those who had less physical activity were more likely to complain about their sleep, but it wasn't really uh, as effective as the psychological factors explaining 30% of their sleep complaints, um, and those were depression and stress. Now, stress didn't come out as the significant variable because stress and depression are so interrelated with each other, but those two psychological issues explain a lot more of the sleep complaints than the physiological variables. And there are some social factors, being in a supportive relationship, multiple roles, um, wife, mother, employee had nothing to do with their sleep complaints, but ethnicity and, and education uh, explained about 4% of, of the variance in their sleep problems. So again, mostly psychological um, health issues. To summarize these studies, uh, we really don't know much about women's sleep in midlife and how it looks before they go into menopause. Most studies will actually look at women who are menopausal and, and that they've actually had no periods for a year, and then they are eligible for studies. We were looking at the women in that decade before, um, and we dropped them from the research once they became menopausal or had a hysterectomy or went on hormone therapy. Uh, so we, we're starting to learn a bit more about women in this age group. The psychosocial factors play a larger role than hormones, and women self-report more problems than men, but the objective measures are very similar in all of these studies. Now, in the African-American women who are self-reporting poorer sleep and actually sleeping less, um, the objective measures are similar to their subjective reports. So I want to switch now to what is sufficient for a good night's sleep. You're all wondering, how much sleep do I need after uh, showing you these data? Um, but what we really would say is the average person needs seven to eight hours. Some of you may be under the impression that you need eight hours and you need eight hours every night. That's not true. You need what you need. And it should be something between seven and eight hours. Adolescents need more like nine hours. But the average person needs seven to eight. It varies considerably. And sleep loss, this is the uh, old quote, sleep loss of as little as one and a half hours can decrease daytime alertness by 33%. I like the blood alcohol uh, comparison better. Um, how much sleep do you need? <laughs> You need the amount that permits you to be awake and alert and energetic throughout the day. So if you're falling asleep in this lecture, you, you're needing to get more sleep. If you're falling asleep at home watching TV, you need to get um, more sleep. If you're getting five or six hours of sleep and you're okay, you're not falling asleep, then that's what you need. But if you're sleeping eight hours and you're still having trouble staying awake during the day, you need more than, than eight hours. So it's a good test of, um, of how much you need. When to be concerned about your sleep is if it takes you longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep on three or more nights a week. So an occasional night when it takes you a long time to get to sleep, don't worry about it. But if it's three or more nights a week, uh, we would be concerned and want to really look at initiation insomnia and what's going on. If you wake up three or more times a night, now menopause is one reason, but there could be other reasons, and you may not know what's waking you up at night. I had one case, a very bizarre case, where he said, I'm, I wake up at 3.10 every night. I said, oh, okay, really, and what, do you have to go to the bathroom? What's the, no, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I don't have any problems. I wake up at 3.10, and it's driving me crazy, and I need to do something. So we did the traditional, you know, keep a two-week diary and see, and he was waking up at 3.10 most nights. A couple nights a week, he wasn't. So we were, both of us, very puzzled by this. Usually, they'll come back in in two weeks and say, I don't need you, I figured it all out, you know, from self-monitoring and, and looking at their own patterns. But we were both still puzzled. So I said, well, why don't you do me a favor for the next couple nights, just set your alarm for 3.05 and see what happens. And sure enough, it was the neighbor upstairs who was putting on his boots at, at, in the middle of the night to go to work. So I don't know what happened with the neighbor, but um, <laughs> But it, it, you never know. You never know what's causing these awakenings at night. That was 
pretty dramatic. What I usually suggest is that if you don't have a bed partner who's listening or watching you sleep, you can actually tape record or videotape your sleep and, um, and look at it and see what you, what you see. You may find that you're kicking a lot and every time you kick your arms or your legs, your brain is aroused, is, a, is awake. It's not in deep sleep or light sleep, it's, a, it's awake. You might find that you're um, snoring. A lot of people find that. And it, when you're snoring and it gets to the point where you, you stop breathing and have a little bit of an apnea spell, your brain wakes up to get the oxygen going again. You, you might thrash a little bit because if you're obstructing your airway, you're kicking and moving and you might wake up feeling choked or feeling like someone's strangle strangling you or you might feel like you're coughing um, or choking. So it could be a, a sleep disorder problem. If you're waking up because of um, acid in your, in your throat, you taste acid, it could be some esophageal reflux and, and sleeping at a higher angle might be helpful. But we don't know, when you're asleep, you really don't know what's waking you up. When you wake up and you think, well, I'm awake, I guess maybe I have to go to the bathroom. So you get up to go to the bathroom, but you, normally during the night, you don't wake up to go to the bathroom. Your kidney function is much, much lower at night. You shouldn't be waking up um, to pee. That, that's not a good reason. But when you're lying there awake, thinking, why am I awake? I might as well get up and, and go to the bathroom just in case. Um, so awakenings during the night are real issues. If you have a bed partner, ask them if you snore, if you stop breathing. We've had women in the past who, um, before sleep apnea got well known, would come into the clinic and say, do something with him. If you don't put a hole in his throat, I will, because uh, we, the only treatment in those days for sleep apnea was a tracheotomy. And um, women were so desperate, they would they lie there waiting for him to breathe again. And it's, it's frightening, it's very scary. So they're not getting any sleep either. So I would have them tape record it, take it to their doctor. And instead of what we noticed in some cases, the women being told they were neurotic and getting the prescription for Valium, um, because the husband, or bed partner or male is, is in denial, says, I don't have any problem. I don't have no problem whatsoever. So I would have them tape record it, and take that to the doctor to play it, and then they were taken seriously. But we would get tapes of, of bed partners who are sleeping in different rooms now and banging on the wall, stop, snoring, turn over, um, all kinds of issues of, uh, for awakenings during the night. And, some, and the women are, afraid to go to sleep when they're uh, sleeping with somebody who has sleep apnea. They're thrilled to get the treatment. Sleep apnea is treated very successfully with nasal CPAP, nasal continuous airway pressure. Uh, it not only keeps the airway splinted and open at night, but it's a nice white noise sort of machine that uh, is soothing and, and, um, and restful to, to bed partners. That's the, um, when to be concerned is um, a lot of these issues. The other thing is falling asleep during the day. Obviously, if, if you fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow and you fall asleep during the day when you don't intend to, um, that's when you should be concerned. And if the bed partner is reporting excessive limb movements or loud snoring or your breathing stops. So I want to talk a little bit about the pineal gland and melatonin and why we, why we sleep anyway um, and some of the physiology behind that. So this is just a picture of a night scene, but we're controlled by day and night and light and dark. Light comes in through our retina, through the eye into the retina, and light is a signal actually to the brain and to the pineal gland when there's light don't secrete any melatonin. When it's dark, secrete melatonin. So melatonin is our hormone for knowing whether it's day or night and whether we should be asleep or awake. Melatonin is, is often in um, health food stores and um, over-the-counter remedies for sleep problems, but it's really meant to be a hormone that signals that it's getting dark outside, not that it's time to go to sleep. So 
the best use of melatonin is the sublingual type that you put under your, under your tongue that's very, very, very low dose. And you, you take that when it's getting dark, and then you get naturally sleepy uh, in the right time zone. So it's very effective for uh, jet lag, um, for shift workers, for anyone who's actually traveling out of their time zone and needs to be alert and oriented. It can be quite effective, but it's not a sleeping pill, even though it's marketed that way. So the point of this slide, too, is that when it's dark and you're secreting melatonin and your brain says it's nighttime and I'm getting sleepy and I should go to sleep, how many of you have the bright lights on and you're reading at bedtime and you're doing these It's getting the brain very confused about whether it's day or night. And that little pulse of night light can wake you up and alert you and have your brain think it's daytime now and you're awake and ready to start. So light at night should be very, very minimal. A night light when you need it. A flashlight would work fine. Um, but not turn on the lights and, and go explore the house and get yourself all awake and eat and do the light from the refrigerator is too much light at night. So you want to keep it as dark as possible. How this then works out is in our actual cues for day and night and our genetics, of course, but we tend to be day people and we have 24-hour rhythms that are, are situated with light and dark, and light and dark are our more powerful time cues. If we're in a cave and we don't know if it's day or night, we start to drift off and our, and our cycles become more like 25 hours. So we tend to phase delay, which we all do on Friday nights don't we? It's easier to stay up later on Friday and Saturday night. And then what happens on Sunday night when we have to go to bed earlier, it's very hard to phase advance our rhythms. Um, our light and dark cues are sensi more sensitive to some people, but others respond to just the habitual daytime meals at the same time every day. Getting up at the same time every day helps you keep in train to, to your rhythm. I think with um, the story earlier about getting ready for a trip, a lot of times I think jet lag is really nothing more than that sleep deprivation you had the night before trying to get ready for the trip. But it really is a true uh, situation where you're out of sync when you're in your brain with what the day and night looks like. They do know from some studies that it, for every hour you shifted, so if I went to New York City, uh, three hours, it would take me three, three days for every hour, so about nine days to actually get into the new time zone and my normal rhythm would start there. If I just want to be in New York for the day, a party, go to a play that night and come right back, I don't want to get to be a New York person. I want to just stay in my California time zone and I don't want to get all the light exposure in New York. I want to get back to, to my city by the bay and get the light um, in, the, in the normal cycle. So you don't get too jet lagged for short trips. So here's a, a cartoon sort of depiction of temperature rhythms and how we look at chronotype. Chronotype or our time of day of feeling best is related to light and dark. and and shifts in when we actually secrete melatonin and our body temperature rhythms. These were oral temperatures taken in a group of young people, but what they point out is that if you're a morning person, you have a peak in your daytime activity in the afternoon about 4 o'clock, and the nadir, or the trough in your rhythm, um, is at about 4 in the morning. If you're an evening person, you're likely to be later and have your morning trough later in the day. So how many of you feel like you're larks? You get up early in the morning, you're much better in the morning. Okay, so you're a morning person. Your um, temperature is pretty much like that. You want to wake up about two hours after your lowest body temperature. It's very hard to wake up at four in the morning. But once your temperature starts to increase, 
you're starting to alert and wake up. How many of you are more evening people? Okay, you're this uh, later peak. Your temperature in the morning doesn't even bottom out until about 8 in the morning, and you don't want to get up till about 10 or 11. It's very hard to get up, but you do because of work schedules and so on. So then you drink caffeine to wake yourself up and um, stay more alert. So you can counter some of these, but this pattern explains a lot of, of issues um, with how we behave. Now there are more women who are morning people, more men or who are evening people. And as I said earlier, it's much easier to phase delay. So a morning person is, is more likely to be able to stay up later and later and go to bed when the evening person goes to bed. But an evening person can't go to bed earlier. They just don't sleep. So some of the insomnia that you might have of taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep can be actually related to trying to go to bed when you're out of phase with your normal rhythm. But women, it's my theory, and nobody's ever tested this, but I'm thinking if women are more of the morning type person and they're staying up later to go to bed with an evening person, they're always constantly sleep deprived and out of phase with their rhythm. Um, but it's easier for them to delay, and an evening person just can't, can't go advance their rhythm. Um, it's just a theory, but it, it's interesting because I think, you know, when you're trying to meet someone compatible in your life, it's much easier to ask them about their acrophase and see if you're compatible than their astrological sign, which means not much when you, when you think about your chronotype and your circadian rhythms. Um, we have a lot of people who probably it works out if you are the opposite when you're raising children. You, you know, you take the early shift, you take the late shift. Um, but sometimes it creates a lot of issues with not having the same sort of chronotype um, in the families. So in this poll that we did uh, with the 50-something, I want to come back to the sleep aids before we um, finish and open it up for questions. But women in their 50s are more likely to use sleep aids. There's a doubling of sleep aid use in women in their 50s compared to their 30s. Um, a lot of women don't like to take a sleep pill when they have children that they're responsible for. They're afraid they're not going to wake up. So part of it might be that they're taking um, a sleep aid when they feel like it's safe to do so uh, in their 50s. Benzodiazepines are the sleeping pill most commonly prescribed. They do actually a great job of facilitating sleep onset. They will make you drowsy and, and put you to sleep. Um, Benadryl is a very good sleep aid as well. The side effect is sedation and drowsiness, even though it's used for itching and so on. A lot of times, if you take a Benadryl for an allergy, you fall asleep. It's making use of that. Uh, it doesn't change sleep architecture very much at, at all. So it's a good uh, uh, once, once in a while sort of remedy. It's helpful when other things aren't so effective. So if you've tried, um, hot tea or hot cocoa or Ovaltine. How many of you have tried Ovaltine? Uh, or some, you know, your granny tells you to drink a warm glass of milk. If that's not quite working, a, a sleeping pill can, can be helpful. But it can really aggravate sleep-related problems like uh, sleep apnea, or restless legs, or so on, because it makes the, the condition worse. And they're really not very effective for very long. So you can develop um, a, a, an ad uh, adapt to the medication and you need to take more and more higher and higher doses to get the effect. So it's not recommended to use more than one or two nights a week. We ask people who are taking it to go on a drug holiday and not really um, take it for a few nights. And it can have a very bad hangover effect primarily in women who are getting the same dose as a 250 pound man um, and the, the side effects can be more um, prominent in, in women than men. The side effects include daytime sleepiness. So what you're trying to actually help with getting enough good night's sleep so you feel good during the day can actually cause that hangover long-term um, side effect of daytime sleepiness, usually because benzodiazepines have a longer half-life. So sedation, the buildup tolerance, 
It can actually help uh, cause some depression and, and um, memory impairment. We had a big sleep conference in Copenhagen one year when um, uh, Halcyon was coming out on the market and some of the sleep uh, researchers were taking it and they couldn't remember the trip. They, you know, they thought, uh, I mean, that was one of the, the main problems with it. So there are some nasty side effects uh, and, um, and problems with benzodiazepines. Some of the more short-acting non-benzodiazepines are worth actually looking at if you need to, to get a good night's sleep. Let's say you're, you know you're giving a lecture tonight <laughs> and you want to sleep really well last night and make sure you're rested for today, I, I'd probably take a Zolpidem and Ambien. They're very short-acting um, and uh, don't interfere with the sleep architecture that I, I showed you earlier. Sonata is very short-acting, so if you wake up multiple times during the night, you could take Sonata once or twice um, in the evening. Uh, Rosarum is actually a melatonin receptor in the brain, so it's very effective if you are a shift worker or if you're trying to do um, some travel across time zones or have a restful vacation. So there are some um, sleep medications. I don't endorse them. It's much better to deal with um, your sleep in a more uh, behavioral way. So I'm going to talk about some of those issues in the last few minutes. Um, replacing the sleeping pills with sleep hygiene has been found in lots of meta-analyses to be very effective and for long-term use. They much prefer um, sleep hygiene and cognitive behavioral therapies to, to sleeping pills. So when we were doing a study of um, women with HIV infection and trying to help their, their sleep problems, we developed a sleeping better, um, and the better actually stands for something I'll go through with you. One of our patients designed and did the cover for the booklet, and, um, and this is what sleeping better looked like to her. We used that for our um, booklet after that. Sleep hygiene, sleeping better, the B stands for the bedroom environment. So you need, obviously, a comfortable bed and, and a, a comfortable mattress. Um, it, you need to feel safe and secure in the room. It needs to be cool rather than warm and dark rather than light. Comfortable bed, it's sort of obvious. Safe and secure, maybe there's a good reason for a lot of the women who wake up during the night or can't fall asleep really feeling unsafe. And if you think about uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and violence against women and intimate par partner violence, that occurs when women are asleep and they're awakened suddenly in, in a violent attack. So feeling safe and secure it is an issue particularly for women. Um, cool rather than warm. There have been some studies done on women who have menopausal hot flashes, and if you sleep in a room at 16 degrees centigrade, which is freezing cold, you don't have hot flashes. <laughs> so if you want to try that, go ahead. Um, we haven't studied that very much. But if you, uh, in a cool environment, you're more likely to, uh, to have a better night's sleep. And of course, dark instead of light because of what I talked about with melatonin secretion. Eating is a, another component, and you just had this last week, but I want to talk a little bit about diet. If you have a protein snack in the evening before bed, um, that can help. Um, we used to actually talk about tryptophan and a snack of tryptophan or L-tryptophan tablets, which have been taken off the market because of of contamination and uh, liver failure problems. But essentially, tryptophan is a nice amino acid in protein, and any kind of protein is a good snack. And it helps that serotonergic pathway and sleep onset. And melatonin and serotonin are um, work in, in synchrony, so it's important that you have a good balanced diet of, of protein. When people are malnourished, and starving, sleep is very disrupted. Um, but when people are well nourished, it's, it's pretty good. Avoiding caffeine within four to six hours of bedtime is important. Caffeine is a stimulant. But I have some patients who tell me, oh, you know, I can drink coffee at bedtime. It doesn't bother me at all. And then I'll think, OK, what time did you have your coffee? Well, uh, 10 o'clock. Well, so what happens when you wake up at 2? 
how did you know I woke up at two? And it's the half-life of caffeine, you know, wearing off and kicking in and so on that's a, a particularly problem. But if someone is very sleep deprived, of course they can fall asleep whether they've had coffee or, or not. Um, but it's when, um, when, you, when you avoid it altogether is the best um, remedy. But older people usually have to stop drinking coffee after noon, after 12, because the half-life of caffeine is longer and longer as we get older. And uh, some younger people have shorter half-lives, so you can metabolize it much faster. Avoiding alcohol, especially before bedtime, is important. Alcohol does help you fall asleep. It's a good sedative. It puts you to sleep. But it's very disruptive of the sleep stages, and it suppresses REM sleep. It suppresses deep sleep stages, um, much like any other CNS depressant. So avoiding alcohol is important. We have a lot of shift workers who will actually go home in the morning and drink alcohol to help them fall asleep or go to the bars that are open all night and then drink and go home to go to sleep. But it really fragments your sleep um, terribly. Tension, now this is um, a really important area of, of relaxation prior to sleep. You don't want to read a mur murder mystery at bedtime if you're like me. I never go to sleep if I'm that um, uh, worried about who, who done it. Um, I, I'd like to settle down, take a warm bath, read a good book, uh, have a warm glass of milk, something to help relax and get that routine going to help me sleep. Time in bed, trying to sleep, is a big issue with cognitive behavioral therapy um, in sleep. We don't want you to associate the bed with restless sleeping and tossing and turning and thinking and cogitating and um, catastrophizing. You want to get up, go to another room, read, a, read quietly, and not associate the bed with having trouble going to sleep. Only go back to bed when you are sleepy and ready to go to sleep. It may take a few nights, but keep getting, get up, go somewhere else, go back to bed when you feel sleepy. If you're not sleeping, get up again. Um, you'll get a lot of books read, and then you will get sleepy at, um, the next night and, and uh, go to sleep. But it takes some, uh, some work with um, cognitive behavioral therapy and therapists to help you through those kinds of problems. But if you wake up early, get up, get going, don't spend your time tossing and turning and, and feeling exhausted. Exercise is very important for sleep. We saw that in the midlife women who, um, when they didn't exercise, had more sleep complaints. Exercise is something that tells your brain this is what activity is like, and then you have nighttime to settle down. We don't know whether it's the actual physical activity or the light exposure that you get outside when you're exercising that's more important, but exposure to light and physical activity in the morning or early afternoon is important. We don't want you to do physical activity before bedtime because that's more arousing. Any of you have small children and you play with them before bedtime, they're hyper and they're not going to go to sleep. They're excited and you um, become the same way. And the, the last R in better, sleep better, is for rhythm. Um, keeping a constant daily rhythm for what time you eat meals, your social activities, for sleeping, and for light exposure is really important. We have a lot of clients who are in nursing home settings where they may not get a lot of light exposure. If you think about a dual room where one, one elderly person's by the window and the other's by the door, who's getting the light exposure and who isn't, and who, who would you predict might have more sleep problems? Um, the one who's not getting the light exposure. Social, and if you're in a nursing home setting, eating and routine meals are very important, and socializing at the same time every day is what helps keep them in train to the 24 hours. And light, light exposure is, is important, not in this room. <laughs> um, this is just a cartoon to summarize everything. Uh, this is uh, the sleep phases of the American female. She sleeps whenever she wants um, as an infant. She's in bed by 8 o'clock, but she wants to stay up till midnight. And here in adolescence, she's up till midnight. And then in midlife, it's to bed around midnight. 
with all the chores to do. And then in old age, sleep whenever she wants. Um, so it's full cycle of sleeping whenever you want. I thought that summarized the lifespan issues. And this is a slide from the Healthy People 2020, um, fairly new guidelines and objectives that have come out. Provides us with 10-year objectives for promoting health and, and preventing disease. And I'm really thrilled. In 2000, um, 2001, there were no, in 2010, no mention of sleep in the Healthy People objectives. In 2020, it's sleep in four whole bullets. So what we want as a healthy objective is to increase the proportion of teens who are getting adequate sleep, the proportion of adults who get adequate sleep, make sleep a priority for you, decrease the number of motor vehicle accidents that are attributed to drowsy driving. The worst day, in, in a study done in California uh, showed that the worst day for automobile accidents is the day, is the Monday after daylight savings. And when they compare with all the other Mondays, so it's the Monday when we change time and we lose an hour's sleep is the worst. It's still bad to gain an hour's sleep because of the light and the dark and the changes in, in some of the vision, but the, the most motor vehicle accident rates on the Monday after daylight savings. And we also want to increase the number of adults with sleep apnea sorts of symptoms who get medical treatment. It's treatable. We don't want um, accidents on the on the roads because of uh, sleep apnea, which is the leading cause of sleep deprivation, particularly in men. So with, I can take questions. I also wanted, on your slide, on your handout, I've given you the National Sleep Foundation at um, www.sleepfoundation.org. And they have information and pamphlets that you can take a look at and polls every year. Uh, they have polls on teenagers, the polls we've done on women, and so on. And then I added to the slide that's not on your handout, the National Institutes of Health. At the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, you can actually look at some of the pamphlets they have for healthy sleeping, pull down lots of different topics that you can look at, including a 60-page um, sleep guide with where you can get information, where you can get resources and, and um, treatment. And there's a quiz you can take um, um, with, I think we've covered some of those questions here, but you can look at that. So it's a very helpful site. The National Sleep Foundation's a, a pr good public website, and the NIH, of course, your tax dollar is working for you, so it's all free, and there's a lot of good information there, too. So I'll stop there, and um, thank you for staying awake, and I can take questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, in the purple back there. So what do you think? Yeah, the question is about what, what about broken up sleep when you actually have a bed partner who doesn't get home till one in the morning and you're a day person and you've got to get some sleep so you can be at work early in the morning. Do you sleep for a few hours, wake up, welcome him home with a, with a meal and, yeah. Yeah, um, and interact a little bit and then go back to bed? It's not ideal, um, but it works. I, I think you, if you're okay during the day and it's enough for you, fine. If you're waking up and then you're awake and it's hard for you to get back to sleep, I would imagine, and then it's time to get up in the morning, it, it's a problem. But, you know, a few nights a week is not going to be bad. You could decide on which nights and schedule a date. Um, and then on the other nights, he tiptoes in and he's very quiet and doesn't wake you up or sleeps in another room. That would be that would be nice. Uh, that slide I showed you of the normal sleep architecture in a young, healthy person. My students pick up that information, and then they say, "So if I really have to get this paper done, I'm going to go to bed at 10 and get two hours of deep sleep, and then I'm going to wake up and work for a while and go back to bed at four and get two hours of REM sleep, <laughs> <laughs> and skip that stuff in the middle. Does that work?" Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not the way you really want to live your life. Um, and, and technically, you, you need both deep sleep and REM sleep to feel functional. Deep sleep is more to help you feel re rested and restored. REM sleep is to help you build memory. So if you stayed all no up all night cramming for a test and you didn't get any REM, you might remember it long enough to get through the test, 
but not enough to actually remember it um, after a week. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, data on sleep and SSRIs, um, serotonotic, serotonergic reuptake inhibitors. Thanks. Um, you know, they because they deal with the serotonergic pathway, they can cause insomnia. So a lot of people will take it in the morning, and then their sleep is not affected by. Um, their SSRI medication. If you take it in the evening, it can sometimes prevent you from falling asleep. So depending on what kind you're taking, what kind of side effects they have, uh, morning or evening can make a big difference. No, I mean for taking it, does that affect what we do? Does your sleep change with the seasons? And, uh, and yeah, uh, that's a good question. In the in Anybody ever lived in Finland or northern um, Norway, where you're above the Arctic Circle and it's dark all winter, there's a much higher rate of alcohol and depression, winter depression, um, because melatonin is just always being secreted. There are probably other reasons as well, but yes, sleep is very much affected by long days, short days, um, dark and light. Uh, when it's light out all evening, uh, midnight sun, it's hard to go to sleep. It's, a, it's energizing and it, it's problematic. So um, there are some issues. Some people have winter depression and it's directly related to the long dark winters. You can self-medicate. Uh, a lot of people take their ski vacation in the snow and they get lots of light on the, on the ski slopes in the winter or they go to Hawaii and get lots of sun and light. So it's kind of a self-medication for um, seasonal affect disorder. Uh, the question is about the, the wrist accelerometers and other commercial products that are out there to look at um, sleep and monitor your own sleep. They're, they're pretty good. Uh, they, they're actually not that great if you have a sleep disorder because uh, they're very inaccurate. They're counting on you not to move much and to sleep a lot, and then they're, they're great. Uh, they're very reliable and, um, and valid, but when you're up a lot, they become less and less accurate. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some apps out there, too, that uh, are very questionable, haven't really been studied. Um, so, you, you know, use your best judgment. Uh, how many are wearing Fitbits? Fitbits... Um, the local San Francisco company, their nice accelerometer. If you look at those types of, of monitors, they're three-dimensional accelerometers, so they're getting the speed of, <laughs> thank you, yeah, there's one. They're, they're getting the speed of your movement as well as whether you're going uphill or downhill, so they're very good for daytime activity monitoring, much more valid than a pedometer. But a pedometer, if you use a pedometer, it tells you how many steps you're taking and you can self-monitor. So uh, the question is about uh, designing an a intervention using um, meditation and slowing down your breathing, slowing down your heart rate, and helping with sleep. It didn't come up in in our work, we asked women what kinds of physical activity they did, and a lot of them, as you can imagine, in the Bay Area did yoga um, as a form of physical activity. Uh, they didn't really talk about it too much, but there have been a few studies. One very old study of paced breathing that helped menopausal symptoms, and then uh, some are really picking up on yoga breathing to help decrease arousal and and estrogen estrogen's an interesting hormone it it's uh, Greek for to make frenzy <laughs> you know that <laughs> so when when you you know going through menopause and estrogen um, fluctuates it, it can be uh, problematic probably in terms of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So I, I would think it has probably some really important um, link 
metabolically you could test it, sure, sure. The, the problem with that is that whatever we try to do during the day to help is going to help, but it doesn't mean it's going to help once you go to bed and go to sleep. It's a different part of your brain that's working, and you, you can't really control it. But as much as you can do to relax and you know, downshift um, so that you can fall asleep, the better. Maybe I could mention, because I yeah. know a little bit about that, and let me just sure. um, step in. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Lee for a fabulous presentation. But, and I think these questions have been really good. Uh, just to pick up on the, the person who mentioned that they'd been taking SSRIs for a long time and that it has, it sounds like it hadn't really helped sleep. And so uh, it might be good to go back to your physician or, or the person who prescribed that or talk to your primary care physician about that because, um, but you don't want to make any changes in that prescription after this period of time without someone guiding you because your body is really adapted to it. Um, but I think that if it's not meeting your needs, it would be something to look into. You mentioned light, and I just wanted to mention, too, that there are now, for seasonal affective disorder, some people, you can purchase now lights that are, that really will mimic outdoor light. It's not as good as going out for a walk or being in the sun, but they use those in Europe, and some people, that can be helpful, too. And, you know, those are very special lights that you can actually, you have to think about when you use those, um, because you want it to fit the time that would be right for you, um, and there's advice about that. And then I was just going to pick up on the meditation, mm -hmm. that I think that um, in your better what was one of the T's was? Tension. It was tension. And so I think that there are mindfulness meditation, deep muscle relaxation, things like that can be used to try to bring that tension level down. And I'll be talking about that in the, one of the later lectures. I think it's number six. But I think that's what you were referring to is we've, we have so much tension. And so it's, you know, you described reading a good book, but you could also, if you've learned deep muscle relaxation or mindfulness, it's interesting to take these classes. And I have, the Osher Center has mindfulness-based stress reduction classes that they have in the evening. And you'll, it's interesting, these are often in the evening, and you'll hear people falling asleep <laughs> when they're in the mind, you know, and the teachers will go by and they kind of nudge people because they'll start snoring or something. Um, but some of that is sleep deprivation. When If you take a yoga class, you're just doing a body scan, trying to relax, and you immediately fall asleep, it, that would be the sign. Mm -hmm. But that is something, this gentleman mentioned it, and that is something that could be helpful for the BET, I think it was the first T, uh, that, that um, Catherine mentioned. So I um, want to give you some homework. I'd, uh -huh. I'd like you to th pay attention to some of your sleep patterns this week. Does anyone have, the, just before we close, um, and then we'll repeat it for the tape, does anyone have something that they found really helped them sleep? Yes, lady in the back. Or is that Joe? Hmm? Chamomile. Chamomile tea. Very, very good. And there's some data to support that, just like there's data to support uh, meditation. We have one more hand. Yes? Valerian. Oh, yes. Valerian. Valerium. Valerium root. These are some suggestions of herbal remedies that, and, um, that people have found to be helpful. And there are actually quite a few of those uh, and data to support those. So what I want you to do between this week and next week is pay a little attention to your sleep patterns and whether or not you're waking up because they're heavy boots. Or some people wake, wake up around 3 in the morning because they have alcohol, and that's when it begins to wear off. And so they'll think, gee, I took that glass of wine to help me get to sleep. Why did I wake up at 3? And it's a lot, um, as Dr. Lee was saying. So thank you all for coming. See you next week when we'll talk about We'll get into some issues around mental health, depression, and being mindful of the heart.